the relationship between video games and movies has always been, in my opinion, rather strained, like a pair of back row underpants on a teenage first date. Since the 70s, the two mediums have fed off one another in a sort of codependent symbiotic dance, while seemingly never fully understanding what made the other tick. Like a relationship between two sweethearts from different countries, neither of whom could speak the other's language, romantic liaisons would fall apart as the German lover misunderstood their partner's request for some nudie time and brought a burnt swimming cap full of sauerkraut into the bed. Ja, ist gut. Le pont de Dom. Back in the day, horror movies became light and breezy platform games, and light and breezy platform games became weird, dark fantasy adventure movies that were virtually unrecognisable from their source material. Directors such as Steven Spielberg professed their love for games and dipped their sweaty, eager toes into the games industry's greasy bathwaters with varying degrees of success, while developers have become ever more wrongly determined to graft cinematic language onto games. Oh, look at me! I'm Martin Scorsese! bellows the producer of Alfred Chicken 2. I remember when I first became aware of gaming's weird desire to be more like film. It was around 1986 or 87, and I went over to a mate's house to play on some new computer he'd got called the Amiga, a newly purchased replacement for his BBC Micro. As you might have assumed from this, he was one of those kids whose mummy and daddy had a bit of money. Well, I was still stuck with my ZX Spectrum, and my parents were forced to bring in dirty-minded lodgers to make ends meet, one of whom, a hairy man called Keith, once chased my mother round her bed, I could pay nothing. <laughs> Suffice to say, my so-called friend chose to show off his new toy with the most impressive game he owned, a graphically rich, interactive movie masterpiece called Defender of the Crown, created by a company calling itself Cinemaware. While it played with all the grace and speed of an arthritic dugong, it made my ZX Spectrum look like a tramp's lavatory. Formed in 1985 by Bob and Phyllis Jacob, initially under the name Master Designer Software, CinemaWare set out with the then novel intention of combining arcade-style action with cinematic production values and storytelling. A self-confessed avid gamer and video game talent agent, Bob Jacobs started out creating games for the Commodore 64, having become disillusioned with the quality of the available games. When he later got his hands on a pre-release Amiga, he predicted that it was going to herald a seismic shift for home computing. He subsequently spent a year in Salt Lake City, raising several million dollars through the support of Mormon doctors and dentists to set up his own development studio. Honking to Gamer Sutra in 2010, Jacob said, I became obsessed actually with the idea of trying to create games that had the mood altering quality of an arcade game, but had a story and some minor RPG elements. CinemaWare's first game, Defender of the Crown, was initially published for the Amiga before being reworked for other home formats. It was a medieval romp, in every sense of the word, that pushed the Amiga's hardware like nothing else around. Defender of the Crown was inspired by the board game Risk, replacing its dice rolls with action sequences and the sort of swashbuckling Robin Hood movies that Errol Flynn would slither into a pair of tights for. It was an enormous hit, becoming one of the first must-have Amiga games, and it continues to cast a long shadow. Between 1986 and 2001, it was estimated to have sold over a million copies, having been ported to everything from the Spectrum to the NES, Game Boy Advance and iPhone. Unfortunately, whereas Amiga owners were blown away by the quality of its graphics, once it arrived on the other systems, the basic nature of its gameplay was revealed. Notably, however, Defender of the Crown also holds the distinction of being one of the first games to feature love scenes. Bob Jacob told Gamer Sutra, I really wanted to add a sense of romantic byplay to our games because no one had done it. The whole idea of adding sex was new. No one had ever pulled it off before. He added, I always liked chesty women, so we just went for it. Despite his reputation, Defender of the Crown was a rushed release. Having promised to deliver the game to publisher Mindscape by October 1986, the game's intended development team, Sculptured Software, failed to deliver on time. By July 1986, Jacob was scrabbling around for someone who could complete it before the deadline, eventually offering $26,000 to one RJ Michael, who had written the Amiga's operating system and would go on to co-create the Atari Lynx and 3DO multiplayer. The finished game was put together in just three and a half months, and tepid gameplay or not, the graphics alone would contribute hugely to the Amiga's success. 
following Defender of the Crown, CinemaWare continued to pump out glossy interactive movies inspired by gangster films, Saturday morning adventure serials, Sinbad, developed by one Bill Williams, who lived in a geodesic dome in the desert and eventually left the games industry to become a priest, and even a licensed take on the Three Stooges. Yet it wasn't until 1988 that the company achieved its next sizeable hit. Inspired by cheesy 1950s B-movies, It Came From The Desert was designed by Dave Riordan. Having briefly worked at Lucasfilm in the early 80s, Riordan had researched interactive laser discs and acknowledged their potential. When he later stumbled upon the work of Cinemaware, Riordan wrote a fan letter to Jacob, which ultimately led him to working for the company, where he pitched his idea for an interactive epic featuring giant ants. Jacob remained a true believer in the Amiga, desperate to help it succeed, despite the company's biggest sales coming from converting its games to the Commodore 64 and the Amiga continuing to be overshadowed in the US by the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nonetheless, emboldened by the success of its games, CinemaWare diversified its lineup, attempting to do with sport what it did with movie genres, launching its short lived TV sports range with a football title in 1988 and baseball, basketball, and boxing games across subsequent years. However, the company had been struggling for some time to contain its ambitions, and the storage limitations of the Amiga's floppy disks were curtailing its creative impulses. The company released Disney's cartoon arcade for the ill fated Viewmaster Interactive Vision, a console which used VHS to play interactive movies, marketed to kids and with a poorly considered concept that made it look as if the designer had got confused and thought he was creating a fishing rod for space robots, the interactive vision flopped and took CinemaWare's game with it. Nevertheless, having come to realise that putting all of its spawn into the Amiga basket was only going to take its ambitions so far, CinemaWare doubled down on its efforts to spread to other formats, specifically with a view to the potential of CD-ROM. Bob Jacob made the near fatal mistake of backing the Philips CDI, investing heavily in development before becoming disillusioned with the hardware's constraints. His first proper CD-ROM release was a new version of Defender of the Crown for the PC, then just about nudging ahead of the Amiga as the home computer format of choice, and only the second game ever to be released on CD-ROM. Though essentially unchanged from the original, a fully orchestrated score and full voice acting set it apart from its predecessor. Combined with the ongoing threat of piracy, the company's diversification hit its bottom line. The new world of full motion video was costly, with an orchestra score alone costing around $10,000 per track and actors clocking in for around $500 per day, more than the average programmer got paid. Worse still, CD-ROM remained in its infancy, and the game CinemaWare was making didn't have a sufficiently large audience to justify the financial outlay. In 1990, Jacob made the decision to sell 20% of the company to Japanese game and console manufacturer NEC. With a share of the company and an exclusivity deal with CinemaWare in its pocket, NEC felt it had the perfect killer app for its upcoming TurboGrafx-16 CD-ROM add-on. The FMV version of It Came From The Desert was pegged as the first release between this new partnership. Sadly for CinemaWare, NEC's hardware simply didn't have the raw processing power needed to fulfil its vision. Consequently, the gameplay was simplified massively from even the original Amiga version, and the limited colour palette meant that the video sequences were an ugly, muddy mess. Adding to the company's woes, the TurboGrafx CD-ROM sold poorly, as an add-on to a console that, like the Amiga, was already struggling to hold its own before the all-conquering thighs of Nintendo. CinemaWare never recouped the $700,000 it had spent to develop the CD-ROM version of it came from the desert, five times the cost of most games of the era, and subsequent TurboGrafx-16 releases of its TV sports titles were similarly damaging. The company succeeded in achieving a European Amiga hit with its final CinemaWare release, Wings, a World War I dogfighting game, in 1990. But with the Commodore system still lacking a sizeable foothold in America, it failed to reverse the company's downward slide. Later that year, with CinemaWare and its founder heavily in debt, numerous projects were put on hold, as Bob Jacob began looking for a way out. Talks with Columbia Pictures regarding a buyout stalled. Briefly, it appeared as if Electronic Arts would come to CinemaWare's rescue, but a deal never surfaced. Then, in 1991, Bob Jacob was forced to lay off staff as a way to stop the company hemorrhaging cash. But it also meant that CinemaWare no longer had the manpower to complete the projects that were already in development. Ultimately, the company, its assets and name were sold off. EA and the UK's Mirasoft were among a myriad of buyers, and the brand has since changed hands several times, leading to re-releases on a variety of formats for some of its biggest titles. 
Bob Jacob briefly returned to development, setting up Acme Interactive in the UK, poaching staff from the likes of Ocean Core, and releasing Mega Drive games such as Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing, Battletech, and Batman Returns. When Acme closed doors, merging with the comics publisher Malibu, later to be sold to Marvel Comics, some of its developers founded Neversoft, and Jacob eventually fell back into the role that he'd enjoyed prior to starting Cinemaware, being an agent for games industry talent. It's fair to say that Cinemaware was ahead of its time. It saw the signs that CD-ROM was the future, and though it may have jumped aboard the train prematurely and he capped itself on the tracks, Jacob's instincts weren't wrong. Whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, Bob Jacobs saw the future, and his company's influence can still be felt today. Speaking to Retro Video Gamer in 2016, he belched, We used to compare the action scenes in a Cinemaware title to a song in the musical Oklahoma. Prior to Oklahoma, songs were merely inserted into a musical between scenes of acting. The genius of Oklahoma was to use the songs to move the story along. The songs in the story were in perfect sync. The action segments in Cinemaware games weren't designed to be standalone. The player's success or failure would branch the story, creating a unique synergy. Some, but not most, reviewers just didn't get that. It doesn't take a genius to draw a line between Jacob's vision and the way modern games seem to place as much emphasis on the cutscenes and movie-style storytelling as they do the gameplay. Even the presentation style of Cinemaware's TV sports titles can be seen in today's sports games. As Jacob told Gamer Sutra in 2010, ultimately, I was right. How arrogant can you get? 